on This Week in Enterprise Tech. We're all about HB Mobility, OTDR up in the house, infrastructure management, and is it okay to mine your Bitcoins? Twyet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyet, This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 37, recorded April 15th, 2013. She blinded me with fiber! This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Interop Las Vegas, the largest independent technology conference and expo for IT professionals. If you're in IT, you cannot miss this year's event. Visit www.interop.com to register and use code WELV for $200 off a conference pass or for a free expo pass. And by Rackspace, the open cloud company. At Rackspace, build what you want, where you want, and how you want it, all backed by their world-renowned fanatical support. Try it today. Download the open cloud at rackspace.com open. And by Directory Wizards. If you have a need for directory synchronization, Directory Wizards has the solution. Unity Sync. Offer a truly unified global address list, create a messaging forest, link seamlessly with HR databases, or build a backup forest to aid in disaster recovery. Visit dearwiz.com, that's D-I-R-W-I-Z.com slash enterprise, for an extended evaluation that you can download, configure, and put into action today. Welcome to Twyet This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here. I'm the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, and I'm not alone. Of course not. I'm joined by a spectacular cast of characters, starting with the man right next to me, Mr. Brian Chi Chibert from the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory and Thin Links. Brian, welcome to the Brick House. Thank you, Padre. And, um, you know... Got to got to give props to the Twit Brick House. I've I actually have a Twit sticker on the back of my laptop today. Absolutely. And wait, what are you doing in the Bay Area? We are working on building the Interop Net in a warehouse in South San Francisco. And what's cool is we get to build everything. I mean, right down to the cables that go in between the racks of equipment, and then we'll drop it into a big giant truck and ship it off to Las Vegas. As we do. You know who's not in San Francisco? That's Mr. Curtis Franklin from Enterprise Efficiency. Curtis, wait, wh where, where are you right now? Well, I am in Orlando, Florida yet again. Uh, this time, though, I'm learning stuff. I'm here to attend Photoshop World later this week. Going to learn all about putting together photos, audio, video, just trying to tell stories a little bit more completely over at Enterprise Efficiency. Uh, speaking of photoshopping and photobombing, we've got the photobomber himself, Mr. Jeff Enters from HP. Uh, Jeff, what is your full title? What is it that you do at HP? Hey, Padre, great to have you here. Or great to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. My first time uh, at the Brick House. This is awesome. It's uh, an incredible place to be. So if anybody gets an opportunity to come out, please do. Uh, so I'm the Chief Infrastructure Architect for HP's uh, Technology uh, Services Organization uh, under our world worldwide portfolio team. So I essentially, we go out and help customers uh, strategize about their, their future IT trends. And Jeff is, of course, a member of the Interop team. Just a warning to our audience out there, this is going to be a very Interop-centric show. I believe everyone who's going to be on the show today has something to do with Interop, either meeting, greeting, or just creating big, badass networks. So let's get right to it. This first segment is us talking all about mobility. Now, the, the trend has been to talk about BYOD. That's bring your own device. It's this thing that we've seen in the last couple of years where we've kind of reversed the flow. Instead of going from enterprise to consumer, we've gone from consumer to enterprise. And there's a whole lot of challenges that are involved with doing just that. Jeff, we brought you on specifically to talk about HP's vision for mobility. So I gotta ask, why is mobility different than BYOD? 
Hey Padre, so uh, you know, BYOD is about bringing your own device, right? It's about maybe saving a few dollars by letting people bring their own devices in, and we feel that mobility really goes beyond that. It's about universal access to people, apps, and data. So it's about um, you know being able to have access to what I need, when I need it, where I need it, not just about bringing my own device into the office. So if I start an email at my desk and I start typing away, and, and now I want to go to a meeting room, right? I haven't finished that email. Can I start? Can I continue that email on my mobile device? That maybe a corporate provider, my personal, it's irrelevant, right? But can I can I seamlessly have that data where I need it, when I need it? Same thing with corporate data, right? Can I get seamless access to that data where I need it, when I need it, from whatever device it might be? I might be sitting in a a coffee shop on a on a PC there, right? Not necessarily my personal mobile device, so. The BYOD is really more about the bring your own device, right? Bringing that individual, uh, you know, mobile device into the office. But mobility is really much more than that. It's about universal access to people, applications, including apps and data. I like that. Curtis, let me throw over to you. When we talk about this mobility philosophy, getting access to your data when you want it, when you need it, we've talked a little bit about that. It's gone by several different names, uh, be it BYOD or maybe cloud storage, cloud services. In the enterprise, how much awareness is there that this is inevitable, that we have to move to this sort of unified way of looking at our data and our services? I think it's pretty well there in terms of awareness for especially the larger companies because they began with two groups, uh, their field sales team and their field service people. You think about a company like uh, UPS or Federal Express and all of their drivers who needed to report back what was going on with package delivery. That happened through mobile devices. By the same token, the mobile salespeople were out there going, when I'm at a client site, I need to have access not just to my parts and inventory, but to their records, to their financial and credit information. And those two areas of the financial chain, the sales process and the delivery process, were really what drove this. It all came toward the center. And now there's a general recognition that pretty much everyone in the enterprise needs to have access to data of, at some level, no matter where they are or when they're asking for it. Right. And we like that worldview of always being able to access your data. But CR1 in the chat room brings up a really good point that I want to throw over to you, Chiefert, and that is, he says BYOD, so bring your own device, is really bring your own malware. That's the nightmare of the IT manager, right, of the IT exec, that having all these devices cross that boundary, cross that security line, VPNing back into the office is somehow going to open up the corporate enterprise network to bad things. Yeah, well, one of the big issues that's been happening over the years is there's been a lot of um, change in how you handle devices that get plugged in, not necessarily just BYOD, it's partners coming in and so forth. So a lot of these systems now are able to um, put you on a temporary VLAN, scan your system, make sure you're compliant with the corporate policies, and once that's been done, then allow you onto the production network. Um, so there's a lot more control over, and it all got started a lot with the uh, NAC and NAP, Network Access Control, Network Ac Access Protection uh, movements. Right. Jeff, let me throw this back to you, because this is more than just a philosophy. There's, there's some practical steps that people can take to make sure that BYOD or mobility doesn't mean open and comp compromised enterprise, enterprise class network. What are the things that uh, fall into, say, the HP vision of maintaining security even while you're expanding access to to your data hey padre so i i mean it's it's not just there's not one universal answer right i think that's that's what it's about is going in and, and looking at the situation looking at the needs of of the individual users at the end the needs of the business right <clears throat> as part of a mobility strategy we really uh, advocate, uh, you know, tying it back to the business, making sure that there's that business value there um, and that, uh, you know, that you can see that, you can tie it back and then look at what the actual consumer, your end user needs and who is that end user, right? Making sure that they have access to the stuff they need when they need it and how they need it. So, um, so it's about assessing the situation and we, you know, it's not about keeping these lines up, these these hard walls up between the enterprise and that external community. Uh, you know, it's it's time to start breaking some of those walls down in certain situations and and really starting to open that up a little bit because. 
if you don't, you know, today you've got the drop boxes, you've got even like Google Docs and, and, uh, and other, uh, you know, Google Drive, things like that, that are really bridging that gap between the enterprise and my home user experience, right? So if I want to get access to that, you know, the, your employees want to get access to that information, they're going to find a way. Right. And the challenge is that's bridging that, that, that gap between, you know, it's getting around that firewall, it's getting around that perimeter of the enterprise. And so softening that edge a little bit may actually provide additional security because you will have some visibility, uh, you know, to some extent is, is better than no visibility and letting people find those ways to get, uh, get around the system. I want to talk about that soft edge a little bit because this has been a common complaint among users, and that is, yeah, I, I know the enterprise can give me my devices. I can get my BlackBerry. I can get my secure network with a VPN. But the devices I actually want to use at home aren't easily brought onto the corporate network. Uh, I understand that HP has a different vision for that. In fact, you brought a toy that could show us sort of this crossover device, something that can be used at home, <coughs> something that can be used personally, and then can come in and fully integrate with enterprise corporate network security policies. Yeah, you bet. So here's uh, uh, brought in our, our HP Elite Pad. Just happen to have it with me here. Hopefully we can see that. So I'll quick do a, a spin around here so you can see there's there's kind of the back of it. Um, so it's a little bit thinner and a little bit uh, um, a little bit thinner than the than the iPad. A little bit lighter than the iPad. Same price point as the iPad. But uh, you know, I, I guess this just kind of I brought it in <clears throat> just to give you an example. I mean, this works for me actually. Here's a, a packet trace I had up from stuff we were doing over at InteropNet. So it's great for me to be able to do this. Uh, you know, our, our friend Shebird that we got on the line here today gave me a, uh, a Bluetooth uh, serial adapter. So we're doing console access to switches and stuff. I can actually Bluetooth to here. This has uh, an Ethernet dongle that comes off of it, so I can um, so I can sit there and use it to do those packet traces or do wireless uh, traces. Uh, but a pretty snappy device overall, does really good. Um, but again, this is just, I just kind of brought it in, you know, you guys wanted to check it out a little bit, but also to just kind of show that, you know, this is what it's about. Whether I, whether I bring this from my own home, whether it's provided me by the corporate environment, you know, I think the Windows 8 definitely gives us a little bit more control. It gives the enterprise uh, a few more options as far as control of, of those, uh, of the device. So, uh, you know, that's where, again, it's about really getting down and, and, and talking with customers and understanding what, what their needs are and, and what, their, what, what risks they're willing to take and, and what risks you can mitigate uh, by having the right devices and the right operating systems in, in the right place. And, and again, it's, it's about providing the users what they need. You got the, the digital natives that are out there today that, have this instant access to uh, to the data, you know, in their in their home life, and uh, if they don't have that in the corporate environment, they're going to find a way to get it. And so, and and just as a side note, uh, Jeff will actually be raffling off that unit at the end of the show, so so stay tuned. No, not really, really. No. <laughs> Curtis, let me throw it over to you. I, I'm glad that Jeff brought in that uh, uh, that slate because. It speaks to an unspoken truth about BYOD, about mobility, and about the enterprise, which is you can design all the security features that you want. You can create all the uh, VPN uh, secure tunnels that you possibly can on your network. But if you don't actually give your users something that's attractive, something that is comparable to something they may own on their own, they're just not going to use it. I mean, right? That, that, that's, that seems to be the thing. It doesn't matter if you give me a device that is secure and that is productive and works really, really well with my network security policy. If it's just not sexy, I'm not going to use it. Oh, and you're muted. I don't know that I would say that it's an issue of sexiness. I think it's much more an issue of productivity. We in the enterprise, especially in North America, push our employees to be as productive as possible, as much of the time as possible. They develop a <clears throat> style of working and a level of technology support in their personal lives and then wonder why they have to come into the office and be in what what they see it as handicapped by substandard technology and unnecessary hurdles put in their way the fact is that if it is seen as a roadblock then employees will do their best to find a workaround and in an era of very intelligent devices and cloud storage and processing they more than likely will find ways around it. It behooves IT to not be seen as a roadblock, but be seen as innovators 
who are providing new ways to enhance productivity. BYOD is one response to that. I truly believe that it's a short-term response. I think in the long run, we will see companies deciding that they need to provide the hardware and software for, uh, for employees to stay productive. But it's going to take them a while before they figure out how to provide that state-of-the-art hardware and software on a schedule that lets the accountants be as happy as the employees who are using the IT. Wow, I, I like that. Cheaper, what, what do you think about that? BYOD is a short-term thing. So, uh, in other words, BYOD is a response to the fact that there are so many really good consumer electronic devices that people want to use in the enterprise that we, that we now have to make security policy to fit. But in the future, enterprise, maybe HP, maybe another company, might make the devices that, again, reverse the flow, go from enterprise to consumer. Well, I, you know, the, you know there, I, I'm obviously a big cloud fan. And thin clients are one of the things that, you know, is my bread and butter. I'm seeing a lot more of iPads, probably an elite pad, lots of different types of devices that are that enable mobility. But more and more people are starting to run that in the cloud. So managed desktops, uh, VDI and things like that. It's it's got some legs. So maybe BYOD is going to be slowly morphing into VDI. Only time will tell. Okay. Uh, Jeff, let me throw that back to you. Let's say that the trend does reverse. Let's say that BYOD is, is a flash in the pan. Let's say that the enterprise starts to get that if they really want to be able to protect their networks, if they really want to be able to expand their security policies, that they have to start providing their users with devices that they will use both at the enterprise and at home. Where do you think that leaves us? I, I think another way of asking that question is, what is HP's vision for using devices like the Elite Pad uh, in in the future enterprise class network. So, I mean, you look at you know, uh, I was reading something the other day. The number of I think it was the number of uh, tablets that was purchased in in 2011 was 60 million, and uh, you know, in 2012 it was 120 million. So the, the you know the number of, of tablets being purchased is just exponential growth. Um, so again, whether it's it's that blend of BYOD and or or enterprise provided, I think it's going to be unique to each customer situation and unique to possibly the individual uh, organizational unit within that business, right? The sales staff, it may make more sense for them to do a BYOD type uh, environment, uh, you know, versus some of the other employees. It might be, uh, you know better to, to provide that device. So I think it's going to be a bit of a blend. You know, I think, uh, uh, you know, Curtis was right on, though, about productivity. I mean, that's what this is about. So let them, you know, give them access to the data. Uh, how that happens is going to be unique to the situation, possibly unique to the individual, maybe unique to that business unit. But, uh, you know, assess that situation and find out what, what's appropriate that's going to enhance the productivity, that's going to provide the level of security, because be realistic about uh, how they're getting access to the data they need right now. Right. Are they using Google Docs because there isn't a, an external SharePoint that they can uh, use to collaborate with their clients today? So, you know, things like that uh, it was what we need to look at and determine what the best way is to, to, you know, have that balance of security and productivity at the same time. And, you know, like Chibert said about the cloud, I mean, it, everything's happening up there. And, and so there's a number of different options out there. And, and that's the reason to assess it. Curtis, let me throw it back to you. If if BYOD is, in, in your estimation, a short-term solution, if, as uh, Jeff has suggested, enterprises are going to have to start planning for getting better devices into people's hands that allow them universal access to their data, where does that leave the enterprise? If, if people really, if execs really think that BYOD is something that they don't have to deal with because it's going to go away, does that encourage less of this cloud-centric, always-on, every-time-available mentality that we actually want? No, I think it actually encourages more because what we're beginning to see is that companies are using what's currently BYOD and the cloud-centric infrastructure as a competitive advantage. Uh, business people may be many things, but most of them, if they remain business people, aren't stupid. When they see one of their competitors using a technology as a competitive advantage, even if they philosophically don't like it, they will probably end up using it. I think that a lot of the things that we're seeing now as part of BYOD will remain in use 
they're just going to be provided by the enterprise. Now, the, the key there is finding some way to account for those, to, uh, to take the depreciation cycle into a, a different area. Now, it may require some revisions to the tax code. It may require some creative accounting. But what's really going to be important is as much getting IT and accounting together as it is getting IT and end users together. Chibert, let me throw to you. Nalt in the chat room brings up a point about BYOD graying the area between personal and work device. This is something that we had spoken of before. When I'm bringing my iPad or my <coughs> MacBook or my Windows 8 PC that I use from home into the office, most of the time I'm actually violating my enterprise network policy where I've said anything that touches the network can be searched by my IT director, et cetera, et cetera. BYOD seems to... to lend itself to that, right? I, I, Jeff briefly alluded to this when he talked about the drop boxes of the world. When we have these public cloud utilities that people are so used to using and they're dropping enterprise sensitive data into those utilities, they're violating pretty much every policy that's been put down, yes? Oh yeah, and it's just gotta be a balance. You know, everything's a balance. The whole issue with um, BYOD is that you've got someone else's device that the IT group doesn't necessarily control. We need to have a little bit better tools to be able to scan those to make sure that they're not bringing an infection into the enterprise. But more importantly, um, one of the things that's really gotten me excited is Citrix has a Zen client now where it actually allows you to um, virtualize the workstation. So you can actually run a personal partition. You can run a, um, a corporate partition and so forth. Um, one of our friends on the interrupt team, Mac Daddy, runs that, and it's uh, very effective. Jeff, let me throw this to you. Beatmaster in the chat room, he's a longtime friend, uh, writes something that I think is on everybody's mind, which is we keep speaking about BYOD and security policy as if it's the typical end user who's going to violate it, the, you know, the person who wants to bring in their iPhone or, or use Dropbox. He points out that, at least in his, his enterprise, most of the time security policy is being violated by executives, people who are not used to being told no, people who will fire someone if their iPad doesn't work. How does moving towards a more uh, enterprise-centric view of good devices that can access our data everywhere solve for that problem? Again, I think it's it's about that that persona, right? And letting that persona start to move into the enterprise, right? That consumer persona move into the enterprise, that instant access to people, applications, and data. So yeah, I mean that's absolutely where it starts is at the top, right? They are trying to get that information. They're gonna get it, and they're gonna get around it. And IT is gonna make some exceptions in those cases. What they need to do is really make that the rule. Right, find ways that, again, you may not have 100% control of the device, you may partition the device, maybe a number of different ways to, to help uh, you know, mitigate that risk, but don't expect to have 100% control. Don't expect to have these, these very hard, uh, rigid walls around the entire environment. Let those walls come down just a little bit, you know, balance that risk with, with productivity, because productivity is what it's about in the end, and you know, the businesses are moving towards a more agile environment where they can, where they can expand and contract and go into new areas uh, fast and hard, and if you've got these rigid walls around, it's going to make it more difficult to do that, and it's going to bring down productivity. Jeff, I want to give you the last word on this segment, and uh, I, I want to give it to you with this question. Where do you expect mobility or BYOD to be in, say, three years? Uh, more to the point, what do you think the, the typical Twiat Riot uh, member, someone who works in the enterprise, works in IT, needs to know in those three years in order not to get broadsided by the next round of, of mobility? Yeah, so I think it's it's about, I mean, look at your devices today, right? Have you ever seen a device that doesn't have a, a front-facing camera on it? All right, so it's that it's that uh, you know I think it's I think there's a stat like uh, three out of uh, five things that we do on a device is is people to people connectivity. So <laughs> enabling that connectivity, looking at that long term vision, tying back to the business. That's probably the number one thing is to get those business drivers, get those business goals, understand those, link them back to the the principles of IT. Right, bring that IT organization together. Uh, so it's not just network, it's not just apps, it's not just applications bring those different IT organizations together, look at that long-term strategy as best you can, right? You can't answer all the questions of where it's going to go, but start to start to look at how you can break down those walls. IPv6 is another one, right, that is going to provide uh, direct access. So how do you start to move that, that firewall or that protection layer down to the edge devices 
so that you can provide some level of protection, some level of control, some level of visibility into uh, what's happening with that device. Although you may not have all of it, it's better than having none of it and people going around it. All right. All right. That's a good final word. Now, coming up, we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to Uber Geek Hearts. That is, how do you troubleshoot the fiber in your fiber plant? But before that, I want to talk about our first sponsor, someone that uh, is in the in industry should know this next sponsor. It's Interop. That's right. UBM puts on the greatest show each and every single year in Las Vegas. Now it's in its 28th year, and Interop plans to be the largest independent conference and expo for IT professionals. The agenda, the speakers, the size of the exhibition, and the trending enterprise IT topics that this year's event will cover all point to one unavoidable conclusion. If you're in IT, you can't miss this year's event. Now, here are six important reasons why you need to make plans to be at Interop. First, Interop is vendor neutral. That's its roots. As a big tent IT show, Interop stands alone as the only vendor neutral event where you can compare solutions across a variety of approaches and gain important insight and education on trending topics. Second, Interop offers a breadth of content. Interop offers deep content in over 125 conference sessions and workshops on topics like IT management, big data, cloud computing, BYOD, enterprise mobility, advanced and software-defined networking, virtualization, and information security. Third, Interop gives you hands-on access to 300-plus solution providers. Those same technology categories will be represented on the expo floor, where over 300 companies will exhibit their wares. Catch up with your existing IT supplier, plus explore innovative and new alternatives that take different approaches to old problems. Next, Interop lets you see interoperability in action. It's in the name. One of the highlights of Interop is the Interop Net. It's a real-life network of the newest gear and solutions that we build to support the network, the conference. We're the only ones that do that. Also, Interop offers training specifically for Apple in the enterprise. New this year, Interop has partnered with Future Media Concepts to offer a training curriculum that focuses on OS X and iOS in the enterprise. The Mac and iOS IT conference classes taught by world-class Apple-certified instructors will offer training on managing, supporting, and integrating Macs, iPads, and iPhones into your business environment. Finally, Interop offers the Information Week CIO Summit. And for the first time at Interop, Information Week will produce the Information Week CIO Summit. The summit is a great opportunity for CIOs and IT executives to learn how to drive, fund, measure, and profit from a culture of innovative uh, efforts from those who have done it. The summit will feature technology executive in, in executives, including Lyndon Tennyson, the CIO and Vice President of Union Pacific, Surin Gupta, the Executive Vice President of Technology and Operations at Allstate, and Frederick Holston, the CTO, and Todd Dunn, Director of Innovative uh, in Innovation Intermountain Healthcare. So here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to join me and Chebert and Curtis Franklin at Interop. If you're convinced, visit www.interop.com to register and use code WELV for $200 off a conference pass or a free expo pass. Go to www.interop.com and use the offer code WELV. And we thank Interop for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get back to it. We've got another segment of Stuff My IT Guy Says. This time, we're talking all about OTDR. I'm Father Robert Palacer, the Digital Jesuit, host of Twyde, This Week in Enterprise Tech on the Twit Network, and you've stumbled into another edition of Stuff My IT Guy Says. As you can see behind me, I am at the Interop Hot Stage Warehouse here in, uh, well, a super secret space of California, getting ready for the show in Las Vegas. But sitting next to me is, well, software engineer extraordinaire, Evan Poncelet. Evan, thank you very much for talking to us. Hi, Robert. You are going to explain a phenomenon that, uh, well, we hold dear to our heart whenever we're testing our network, and that is OTDR. For the folks playing at home, what is OTDR? OTDR stands for Optical Time Domain Reflectometer. Okay, that sounds like a bunch of made-up words there. Okay. Put those together. What's that supposed to mean to me? Right. So what that's the study of is um, what happens to light as it transmits down a cable, a fiber optic cable. Um, and so it's following a physical phenomenon where you're transmitting a pulse of energy. And so it actually tr is transmitted as a wave. 
And when it reflects back to you, you can tell a number of different things have occurred on the channel um, just by analyzing carefully what you see and when you sent it. Now, one of the important things to, to realize about OTDR and any, any equipment that uses the phenomenon is that the same side that is sending the light is also gonna be receiving the, the light back. It reflects. Yes. Why, why does it reflect? Right, so the reflection is caused by an index of refraction mismatch. Got it. And so that's actually the same thing that allows you to have mm -hmm. is there's an index of refraction mismatch between the core, which is where the light's actually transmitted, and the cladding, which surrounds it. So what you're seeing here is actually the jacket of the cable, um, but within that, there's the cladding, and then within that cladding, there's the core. Right. And right. so that index of refraction mismatch between the cladding and the core results in something called total internal reflection. And that's the light pipe phenomenon. The fact that we have multiple types of material in here means, as we know, waves are going to move through materials at different rates. Light yes. doesn't move through the cladding as fast as it moves through the core. And so you will get that natural reflection of light. And with that reflection of light, you can, t you can tell what? So with that reflection of light, you can tell the length of the cable. Um, because you know the nominal velocity of propagation of the light right. traveling through the core, which is fused quartz. Um, and so if you know the time that you sent it and how fast you sent it, then you know that if you multiply those two things together, you get the uh, distance that it's taken. So that's actually the round trip distance back and forth. So you have that and you get the length of the cable. Mm. Also from that, you can study certain things like um, there's a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering. And what that is is a measure of how much of the light that's transmitted is, um, is being reflected back at you from just the individual particles within the fused quartz. Um, so there's also a phenomenon of loss. And so that's um, the instantaneous or the uh, a discontinuity that results in that light being diffused, kind of like a lampshade diffuses normal light that you see um, in a normal household lamp. Um, and then there's also a phenomenon called attenuation. And so that's the gradual uh, loss of intensity of the light as it travels down the cable. And so uh, in this case, just to provide kind of a spot example, this is attenuating the light from the camera that I'm seeing right now. And so that's good for my eyes um, because I'm not damaging my sensitive optical equipment here, <laughs> but that's bad for your network because you want intense light so that you can receive that. Right. Now, all of this sounds good on the theoretical level. I mean, yes. we, we like to know what light is doing as it's traveling through our fiber plant, yes. but what exactly kind of, what kind of data can I take from that? Uh, I, I remember at one point uh, there was another fluke engineer who was showing me how just by bending the fiber, he could, he could change the light return and therefore you could make inferences about what was going on with your network. Yes, that's exactly true. So uh, bending the light actually, or, or bending the cable results in leakage of light. Um, so with the cable itself, there's a certain critical bend that you can induce and once it goes past that angle, light will actually leak out of the jacket. Right. Um, and so you want to avoid uh, most bends in cables and that's not to say that it has to run perfectly straight but you want to avoid any kind of small kinks within it past a certain radius, which is usually around the, the size of a dime. If you're bending past the radius of a dime, then you're probably coming into problems. Right. Another big advantage of using OTDR equipment is that I can tell if there's a break. Yes. I, like for example, if I know I have a 300 meter run of fiber, yes. and my OTDR equipment is telling me, oh, I've only seen 100 meters of fiber here, mm -hmm. you know that somewhere along the line, in fact, at 100 meters, you, you've got something wrong with your fiber plant. Yes, and so that can be very helpful for long runs of fiber, but it can also be very helpful um, in a data center environment. Um, and so what you'll need, um, so there's a little, uh, little small issues with that, um, and that you can tell when there's a break, but you can also tell when uh, two cables have been spliced together poorly. And so poor splices can result in all kinds of issues, and, and breaks can result in all kinds of issues as well. Um, and so the number one is that reflectance. So there's that index of refraction mismatch between the air in this case and the break, or just the discontinuity of the broken glass that causes that light to leak out. And so what we can do is measure the distance to that fault um, so that you don't have to go through with a visual fault locator or a red laser or something like this right. and find where that light's spilling out. You can just attach your instrument here, in this case, an OTDR, um, and detect exactly where that break was. And you can also characterize that break. So you can tell if it actually is a break or if someone has gone through and used a fusion splicer to melt the two ends of the glass together or a mechanical splice where they're just using a small mechanical device to hold the two together very closely. Right, absolutely great pro tip. Now they can find out more about OTDR by just, well, going anywhere. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page, funny thing, the tools that are shown on the Wikipedia page for OTDR, well, any guess where, what company they might belong to? Flip Networks. They might belong to Flip, that's right. But where, if they wanted to find out more about your gear and the phenomenon of OTDR, 
Uh, where should they go on the web to find out more about Fluke? Right, so www.flukenetworks.com. We have a products page that actually goes into detail. We have a lot of different product demonstrations. And I think there's also a virtual guide to our OTDR. I mean, we talk about all the different type of events that can go on, um, the different TIA standards that uh, govern how many connectors you can have in series on a link and just all kinds of phenomena, and how to read an OTDR trace, which many people find difficult, but we've also included features to make that a little simpler for uh, network engineers. We're going to be taking a look at this bad boy at uh, sometime in the near future, but until then, Evan, thank you very much for coming on to talk to me. Thanks very much, Robert. And you stay tuned, because that's not the last bit of uh, stuff my IT guy says. Oh, Chibert, you deal a lot with fiber. In fact, I believe you just spent the weekend terminating fiber up in San Francisco. How difficult would it be to do the work that we do with long runs and fiber if, if we didn't have gear that took advantage of OTDR? Well, OTDR is one of those really, really important pieces of equipment that give us the ability to find out just how much light we're, we're possibly going to be losing, uh, whether it breaks and things like that. So we actually use that to go and find out uh, whether a metro fiber has had problems. We've used it in the past, actually, to find out that there was a, a bad patch cable in a long run in one of the convention centers. And by knowing how far away it was, we knew which closet to go look into. So OTDRs are one of those indispensable pieces of equipment. And if you have something nice and small and portable, like the one that Evelyn showed, Wow, that sure makes life a lot easier. One of the things I've always liked about uh, either the JDSU or the Fluke gear that we've used in the past is the ability to see not just the event, so the, the broken fiber, but see beyond the event. You could, you could see several events down the line because of the nature of OTDR. It, it will actually keep going, and, it, and each time it hits an event, it will reflect enough light back for you to, to figure out what's going on. Uh, Curtis, I know you don't deal a lot with enterprise class tools, but... Uh, OTDR equipment is pretty expensive. Does does the the decision to buy, say, a tester, a, a twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollar tester that can troubleshoot the entire physical plant of a building, does that often come up in the mind of, say, a, an enterprise executive? I would say, in general, no. The majority of enterprises are going to depend on contractors to own this kind of specialized equipment because, let's face it. Most physical infrastructure is the sort of thing where you install it once and then with any luck at all, you get to forget that it exists until you move or tear down the building or do some sort of major rehab. So for any sort of equipment that is used on a sporadic basis like that, most enterprises are going to look at either some sort of lease arrangement or in the most likely case, some sort of agreement with a contractor to come in and do the job for them. Absolutely. In the future, we are actually going to do a, uh, a miniature review of one of these pieces of OTDR gear so you can see exactly what kind of capabilities would be built into it. Now, after the break, we're going to be talking all about IT asset management. But before that, I wanted to talk about the second sponsor of the show, one that I'm very excited to have on, and that is Rackspace. Now, when you think of the cloud, you got to think of Rackspace because they co-authored OpenStack. That's right. They were one of the companies that were forward-looking enough to realize that we were going to start moving services out of our racks, out of our colos, into publicly accessible, publicly shared, well, big data centers. Rackspace is all about it, and that's why I'm happy to have them as part of the Twiat Riot. You see, some companies use proprietary technology, which makes it expensive and complicated to move your data if you want to leave. They want you locked in. What you want is an open cloud solution built on open standards. Rackspace is the open cloud company that co-founded OpenStack and now runs the world's largest open cloud. Open cloud means that you're not locked into a single provider. You have the freedom to move your apps, your code, your websites between multiple OpenStack-based clouds, public or private, on-premise or hosted. Oh, big business or small, public or private, services or data, Rackspace is the perfect solution for the Twiat crowd because they get the enterprise. So what we want you to do is we want you to twi uh, tweet out to Rackspace. Let them know that they are welcomed into the Twiat riot because they get us and we get them. Now, do what you want. Build what you want. Do it where and when you want and how you want, all backed by Rackspace's world-renowned fanatical support. 
You can try today. Download the open cloud at rackspace.com slash open. That's rackspace.com slash open. And we thank Rackspace for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get right back to our interop themed coverage. We've got Paul Goodison, the CEO of Cormant, joining us from, well, Paul, where are you coming from? Well, I, good afternoon and thank you for having me today. Uh, I actually live in San Luis Obispo, which is about three hours down the coast, but obviously not from around here originally, from the UK. Um, Cormant's been around about 10 years, helping companies look after their IT assets and infrastructure to really help them manage better. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about IT asset management, what does that encompass? Exactly what are we talking about? The, the term that seems to be common today is, is IT infrastructure management, which really looks at um, areas inside and outside the data center. A very common term that analysts are using a lot today is data center infrastructure management, uh, focusing on the, the infrastructure and the IT in and around the data center. The reason that has become a very hot topic is because it's a very large concentration of IT, it's very expensive, and it's causing enterprises a lot of problems to manage it. If you look at a typical data center today, they will have any number of spreadsheets to try and manage this incredibly advanced, incredibly expensive operation. There'll be a spreadsheet for the asset, there'll be a spreadsheet for the racks, there'll be a spreadsheet for power, there might be a spreadsheet for connectivity, there'll be a spreadsheet for VLANs. And, and that's a terrible way to try and manage um, an enterprise because you've got a, a whole number of little silos of data and people are trying to use those to manage a large enterprise. So what we try and do, and others as well, with data center infrastructure management is take that and the infrastructure around as well, the power, the air conditioning, and, and get all that into a tool which then allows people to manage better and visualize their infrastructure so that they can plan better, they can maximize utilization of that data center in a, in a cost-effective way. Right, right. Now, what we just saw on the B-roll, sorry if you're an audio listener, but we saw a bunch of cables, a bunch of gear that had barcodes on them and then some sort of reader. This seems to be the heart of your solution. What, what is that exactly? What that is is a, a third-party device from people like, uh, this is a, a Motorola one, there's handheld products, there's Intermec devices, and this is actually running Windows Mobile, an older version than Jeff was showing, certainly. Uh, but it's got a barcode scanner as well. And what this allows us to do, and what we can see here is a, a rack view, is mobily see all the enterprise IT. And so this is really to, you know, extending that mobility conversation we had earlier. There's obviously a desktop, there's obviously a web, there's a client, there's network discovery, all those good things. But here, an operator can take this device up to the rack, up to the UPS, up to the, uh, the, the desk, wherever it may be, and, and if you like, scan a barcode, and, and see what that is and, and instantly start managing that device. So here we have a, an interop rack, it's quite a small one, and we have a number of devices and we can look at that in, in various ways. Uh, but next to me here, you can't see it, it's off screen, is a television, which I uh, use the serial number, and if I just scan that barcode, uh, you'll see down on the bottom of this screen, I've highlighted a television uh, in the brick house here. So the ability to manage any type of asset. Now, you saw connectivity there, uh, we saw some barcodes on some fiber cables and copper cables and in fact also power cables. You know, that's, a, that's an added feature which if you scan that cable, um, our solution CS will tell you what that's meant to be connected to and hopefully that's what it is connected to. So from a troubleshooting point of view, you get all the information. You get the asset, the rack, information about that asset, perhaps discovered information about what power it's using at the moment, but also the connectivity you know, what else is it connected to? So you've, you, you can start to marry up the physical and logical worlds to provide a really cool picture of your entire infrastructure. Right. Let me back off the ivory tower for just a second and get down into the nitty gritty. I'm an IT manager and I'm doing it the old fashioned way. So I've right. got either a notepad or may, maybe I'm super, super advanced and I've got an Excel spreadsheet on my laptop that I'm using to keep track of which port is connected to what port on what rack and what piece of gear. Maybe I'm even keeping weights and power allotments so that I can make sure that everything ends up in, a, in the proper balance. What does Cormant offer me that maybe I'm not doing right now? I mean, the, the first thing with those, those spreadsheets is, is get them imported into a tool. Uh, and, and you know our Corman CS tool we think is great for that. It's a very easy import. And what you're starting to do is, is take any number of spreadsheets and, and if you like put them in a bucket um, so that they then have a relationship to each other. Spreadsheets are, are you know 
not bad for point in time, single pieces of information. As you said, the connectivity was in one spree. There's probably somebody else with a, a spreadsheet of the actual rack layouts. He's getting those two in there and allowing people to have a conversation together about that data. You've obviously then got historical data, so you can see where assets have been, what connections have, have been happening. You can trend things like power. You, you mentioned weight. Uh, I know Chibert in the University of Hawaii has a building where weight is actually important. So if you've got a threshold of saying, look, this rack can't have more than 300 kilos or, or you know, 660 pounds, um, having that information in a central place as you're planning that move and saying, okay, I'm going to put another server in, another server in, and then you get a message saying, well, hang on, you've exceeded one of the parameters, which was, which was weight. Uh, it allows you to, to manage within that parameter. I mean, I think the more common one is power or, or, or thermal issues. Uh, we're seeing racks these days where, you know, the old fashioned way was, look, shove as much as you like in the rack. If you've got a switch board and a power port, you're good. Now it's, well, actually, you can't put more than one or two, you know, uh, ESX clusters or, or um, vSphere in there because it's going to actually uh, exceed the power utilization of that rack or the cooling capacity of that rack. And so it gives that visibility. It allows the facilities people who, who often you know, don't get much information from IT to see what IT is planning to do. And that allows them to make sure there's cooling available and those types of things. So it's really bringing together everybody into a single conversation. Right. You know, what I found in using Cormant at Interop is it, it kind of flips around how you build out your network. The, the old way used to be, okay, let's, let's rack stuff up and then let's start taking down uh, power consumption, let's start taking down weight, and hopefully everything falls okay and we've got a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. With Cormit's solution, we were actually able to pre-plan pre how much power, how much cooling, how much weight should go into each and every single rack. It, it helped us to design a network that would be right from the get-go. Chibert, I want to throw over to you. We've both seen networks that are an absolute rat's nest of fiber and copper going every which way, connected every which way, and uh, it, you know, it's, it's almost a one-time installation. You can plug it in once. If you ever need to make, it, make a change, you almost have to disconnect everything because you don't know where anything plugs in. Uh, how has Cormit changed the way that we do Interop? Oh, it's, it's amazing the difference it makes. Where if someone comes to us and says, the internet is down in a booth such and such. We can actually just take one of those tools, scan the barcode on the drop cable inside the booth, and it will actually display the entire cable path. So instead of having to go and dig around saying, okay, which closet is that in? Which switch is that in? Blah, 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 blah. It'll actually go and list all the different pieces that it's connected to so we can quickly find it. So even if it is a rat's nest, we don't care because we know it's switch three, port five. And we can go and check it out and find out what's going on. And it, this applies directly. You know, if you have a large corporation with multiple locations, your help desk now has the ability to say, well, what's the number on your data jack? And go and, you know, be able to find out what switch it's in and maybe you can figure out what's going on much, much quicker. Curtis, most IT people understand why it would be nice to have a, an asset management service or device that works just automatically. <laughs> but it's a hard sell for executives because they typically don't see ROI. Is this just something that we're going to expect, that managers aren't going to want to spend money on something that doesn't have an immediate return? Or do you think, from your experience with enterprise efficiency, executives are starting to get that it actually helps the, the efficiency of the IT department, it actually helps the efficiency of deployments and rollouts if you have a tool like, say, Cormant? Well, I think that what IT has to do is a better job of selling this to executive management. And to me, the real play on this is something that uh, executives are demanding more of IT, and that is flexibility uh, and a certain nimble characteristic to what they're able to do. To be able to say, if we know what we've got, how it's interacting, and what its capabilities are on a real-time basis, that lets us respond to shifting needs much more quickly and efficiently. I think that's the winning argument, and I think that's really the one that we're starting to see IT groups make. Give us the tools, and we can make what we do respond to the business need better. And that's really what IT in the modern era is all about. Right. Let's go to the horse's mouth. 
Paul, what would you say to the executive who comes to you and says, I need you to justify my purchase of your solution. I need you to tell me why my IT people can't just write things down on a scrap of paper or keep it in an Excel spreadsheet. Why should I invest in a solution that automatically will let me uh, show uh, port densities and, and rack layouts? You know, I think it, it does vary by organization, but uh, it's, it's a combination of uh, that Curtis mentioned, the efficiency of people's time. You know, we see organizations where to, to make a change takes days. Uh, planning can take weeks and involve six people because they have to get a number of people together with their spreadsheets to start looking at that. So you've got a response time and, and, and resource issue. You then got the issue of just uh, pure capacity. A new data center might cost somewhere between 20 and 100 million dollars to build. If the, if the enterprise can get another two years out of that data center as they consolidate and they remove unused equipment, there's a massive saving in capital expenditure and at the same time potentially saving money in power. I mean, I think we've all come across servers in the data center that are zombies sitting there using a lot of power but actually not doing any real work. And, and that plus virtualization is very important. So I think it's about uh, people efficiency. It's about... Um, you know, if you like securing the, the capital investment you've made and not needing to make additional investment, it's utilizing IT efficiently. Uh, I've certainly seen lots of cases where people were going out and buying additional switches and or servers, and the switch one's a classic one, because all the ports were plugged in. But actually when they did an audit, they found out that they had 20, 30% of those ports with nothing on the other end. So an you know, incredible cost of just infrastructure but if you can reuse that and, and get visibility into what's actually connected at the other end, you've got a way of saving money. So I think it's asset, it's people, it's the actual facility, the fabric of the building. And then, you know, critically, it's downtime. Um, you know, I had one customer say to me, look, you know, when we have a freeze on, we don't have outages because we can cope with machines going down. When we have people in our data center, that's when we have outage because people don't know what they're doing. This was pre Cormant CS. They, you know, they'd, they'd disconnect a server, they'd unplug something, and actually that was a live piece of equipment. It was the wrong piece of equipment. And, and the cost of that is just phenomenal. And I think that goes up to the C-suite, and people do see that. I mean, someone mentioned, you know, my iPad doesn't work. Well, maybe your VoIP phone doesn't work because someone's just unplugged the wrong server. Uh, it's, it's a number of things, and organizations are different, but it's around those items. So that is the message over to the executive, and hopefully the executive will hear that. But now take me through what a typical deployment might look like. Let's say I'm a mid-level IT person, I'm in the data center, I receive a new load of equipment, a new load of cables, a new lo load of interconnects. How would I use Cormant to deploy that? Well, the first thing is that equipment coming off the truck, depending on the supplier, you may have had an electronic notification of that, which you've actually loaded up already. So we know these items are coming. And in fact, uh, if we take um, ticket systems and, and, and other systems such as ServiceNow, there may already have been a request from a user to start deploying some of those new servers. So long before the equipment arrived, we may have actually planned where it's going. So we're already starting to look at an efficient process. But that equipment off the dock, you may scan it using our uh, mobile device, um, get that into a storeroom so we've got visibility of what we have in the storeroom. We're then using a uh, change management module with tasks, provisioning, to then say, well, where are those servers going? And there's work orders which appear on here for the engineers, the layer one guys, they'll go in, they'll take that equipment, deliver it to the right rack, rack it, stack it, patch it, and every step of that rack, stack, and patch, they're recording on the mobile device in real time. So there's no paper records, there's nothing to update later on. And if you look back at the, the, the data center manager, they have visibility of what that person's doing. So as the person has taken that device, they can see what they're doing, they can see that work order's been closed, and they can then provision that server live, it can go into the next stage. So that's sort of, if you like, a day-to-day -day process, and also the decommissioning part, exactly the same. You want to look at the decommissioning part. If you're looking at a new site, then what we would try and do is take the data we have, and we certainly have some of this from Interop, and import that data in, so we have a baseline information. And if we can do that, we can then use auditing on the mobile device again to go out and check that against real life to make sure it's accurate. And so again, you, you can't plan until you've got a baseline of accuracy. Once you've got that, the process going forward, 
as long as you can enforce it. And, and you know, there's no question here that this isn't magic. There's got to be a process enforced. And, and you know, we know from the interop when we're deploying the booze and we're deploying the racks, when there's a process enforced, it works very well. If, if there's no process, then clearly you've got to go back and do some auditing afterwards. But it's about the process and about using the tool at every step to get from, if you like, that server or that switch arriving all the way through to rack stack and live and then, then end of life as well. Right. Well, thank you very much for that description. Uh, of course, if you want to see Corman in action, uh, the best place will be to go to Interop uh, at Las Vegas, to come to the conference, to talk to Cheaper, to talk to myself, find Paul, and actually ask how we're using it to run the world's most advanced temporary network. Now, right after the break, we're going to be coming back with a chat room requested Enterprise Byte. But before that, I do want to thank our third sponsor. They are absolutely unique in the enterprise and they, they give us, well, a service that you want. You see, here at the Twyatt Riot, the most received question that we get is not about high end, high theory enterprise concepts, but really about the things that make us work the most. And that is syncing. What happens when you want to sync one email server with another, one global address list with another? What happens when you need to move data from one place to another place to have a backup in case of disaster? Well, there are a lot of kludgy types of solutions that you can put together in your own time, or you can go with the number one solution for directory syncing. That's right. I'm happy to announce that Directory Wizards has come to the rescue of the Twyte audience with their all-in-one synchronization solution, Unity Sync. Unity Sync by Directory Wizards provides synchronization solutions, offering countless customization options to conquer the challenges of your specific environment. They offer a truly unified GAL, that's a global address list that lets you create a messaging forest, link seamlessly with HR databases, or build a backup force to aid in disaster recovery. Unity Sync also supports multiple directory types, including Active Directory, Open LDAP, Oracle, Novell, Lotus Notes or Domino, GroupWise, multiple SQL and ODBC databases and text formats. Unity Sync can scale from small directories with hundreds of objects to enterprise directories consisting of hundreds of thousands of objects without requiring extensive training or installation. In fact, your fully functional evaluation copy can be up and running today. The whole package is just five megabytes. There are no per user or cost limits. Pricing is per installation, per number of directories being synchronized. Upgrades and live te technical support for one full year is included in your purchase price and renewable with a yearly maintenance contract. The web-based user interface is intuitive and friendly. There's no scripting or programming required. One great feature is that no additional database is required for the synchronization. Unity Sync is entirely self-contained, synchronizing data from one directory to another without the need to create a third. It does full or partial directory synchronizations, affecting all available or just a few attributes. In other words, whatever your needs, Unity Sync can be configured to suit them. Now, if you don't want to trust me, you can trust all the companies that have accepted Unity Sync as their number one solution for synchronizing. That includes the U.S. government, military, education, professional sports teams. In other words, the companies that can't afford to have their synchronizations go wrong choose directory wizards. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to visit Directory Wizards at dirwiz.com slash enterprise. That's derwiz.com slash enterprise for an extended evaluation that you can download, configure, and put into action today. That's derwiz, dirwiz.com slash enterprise. And we thank Directory Wizards for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get to the fun part. We've got an enterprise bite all about Bitcoins. This came specifically out of the chat room who wanted to hear an enterprise take on, well, a, a common current story. And that is Bitcoin mining. Curtis, have you heard about Bitcoin mining? That's the practice of using typically a high-end computer with GPU uh, processing power to break down encrypted blocks in order to unlock a Bitcoin which has a certain amount of value. Have, have you heard about that at all in the enterprise space? Well, not so much in the enterprise space, but I have heard of it. Uh, this is something that uh, started being a story in the general media a couple of weeks ago with the big run-up in Bitcoin value. 
Uh, I know I heard stories on BBC and other places about people who had basically become professional Bitcoin miners sitting there with systems ready to go off and uh, mine for these coins whenever new tokens were released uh, at you know scheduled intervals throughout the day. All right. We've got a story here from TechCrunch that is specifically addressing the power usage, the power required to mine these Bitcoins. They peg it at about $150,000 in power costs each day. But at the moment, they're generating about $470,000 in Bitcoin related revenue. So at the moment, it makes sense. But one of the quirks about Bitcoin is as you unlock more and more blocks, as you, you, you unencrypt more and more value, it gets more and more difficult to, to uh, decrypt each successive block, which means that at some point, it's going to be more expensive in power costs than you recover in value of Bitcoins. Chibert, let me throw this over to you. Enterprise has long been very sensitive about the amount of power that's used in our data centers. If you've got something that requires a rack of computers to, to uh, unencrypt, uh, at, at what point do you, you really start slamming on the brakes and saying this is no longer worth it? Well, heck, you know, universities and large corporations have already gotten to the point where power consumption and cooling has become such a big deal that you now have to start budgeting it in. In fact, one of the reasons why my big giant Linux mirror site was down a couple of weeks ago is the university actually shut down my entire building so they could go and make sure they got uh, sub-metering in there so that they can start charging the research groups for power usage. Uh, when that kind of thing starts happening, all of a sudden, you've got to start taking a good hard look. But then again, I have access to a supercomputer. I wonder how many Bitcoins I can mine. <laughs> exactly. This was something that we actually brought up at TNT this morning, which is NVIDIA has their uh, grid service, which ties together a bunch of GPUs so you can do massive amounts of processing for just pennies. So uh, I suggested that this would be a good time if you were a programmer to script something to use the power of NVIDIA's grid to, to mine Bitcoins. I, I want to throw over to Jeff Enters because he's been sitting on this couch for a long time. And I think he's asleep and I probably just caught him. <laughs> he has no idea what I'm talking about. Jeff, we're talking about <laughs> Bitcoins right now. When we have individuals who can buy the equivalent of a supercomputer from a decade ago and have it on their desk, well, what are the, the possibilities for someone mining Bitcoins? You know, dropping in a couple of extra graphic cards into his personal PC leaving it on and, and just collecting Bitcoins throughout the day? I think they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's about data mining, right? And so uh, starting getting into the big data. And uh, so I think it's absolutely possible and uh, it's a risk. I, I like that. Okay, let's go over to Paul. Paul, you help us to build data centers. What happens when someone realizes how much money is available in these mined currencies? Uh, the, everything, every type of a virtual currency that, that lets you break down an encrypted block in order to be awarded some value. Uh, do, you, do you foresee people building out data centers using a solution like, say, Cormant in order to maximize the amount of servers that you can put in a particular rack uh, with its balance of cooling and power in order to extract maximum value from power and cooling money invested? You certainly, we certainly do, and I think that's a big change in data centers is really trying to maximize uh, each rack, each row, each hall to get the most computing power they can. And I think this is where we're seeing a lot of virtualization and, and very high density servers. But of course, coming along with that is the fact that there may be 10 or 20 kilowatts uh, when some of these racks were rated for two or three kilowatts. And, and if you start to look at some of these decryption algorithms, obviously the, the, the power usage is variable. If they're starting to do this sort of thing, then obviously the power is going to max out. And that's where you sometimes see people who haven't planned well, breakers tripping and things actually going offline. And, and that's often when people like Cormant get a call and go, can you help us fix this problem? Right. Okay, so let's let's bring this back down from the absurd and actually get it back into the realm of, of the real world. Curtis, let me go over to you. So the way that Bitcoins work is that you can set your computer to, to work on a particular encrypted block. Uh, and once you get that hash, you're rewarded with a Bitcoin. Each time that happens, it gets successively more difficult. Every block, every future block, every further block is more difficult to decrypt. Now, 
when we talk about enterprise computing, uh, uh, for, for all these episodes of Twilight, we've been talking about the gradual move into the cloud, services moving into the cloud, taking advantage of the scalability of power in data centers offered by Amazon or Rackspace or NVIDIA. So in a sense, this kind of is a, a nice little loop where you could use the power of someone else's computer to create value where previously none existed. Uh, what's, what's your take on this? Well, I think it's, it's on two levels. One, you have the Bitcoin specific issue and the, the other is that you have the, the more general case. I think in the general case, uh, you're going to see companies that use various filtering uh, algorithms to lock down this kind of behavior. Uh, there is no way that an enterprise is going to invest significantly in bitcoins and they're going to take a very dim view of their employees using enterprise resources to mine for bitcoins. Uh, and that's true whether it is an on-premise server or lease time on, on a cloud server because one way or the other uh, there's a cost associated with that and ultimately it's going to be charged back either to the IT department and the department that is making use of the local data center uh, or the company if they're paying some cloud provider for CPU cycles. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, I have to admit, I heard a phrase in one of the, the stories that let me know that we were at the bubble point because it was reminiscent of another bubble. I heard one of the Bitcoin miners saying that he had moved his entire retirement account, account into Bitcoins because of the safety of that investment. It reminded me of about, oh, 15 years ago, I was listening to a report and heard a woman say that she had moved her entire retirement account into Beanie Babies because she knew that there would never be a drop in price or demand for Beanie Babies. And to me, that's the first sign that what you have here is a bubble ready to burst. Uh, I like that. Well, I've beat that story to death. So you know what? You've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to one of the coolest, one of the best, one of the most informative enterprise tech shows on the planet. And I say that modestly. But I do want to thank everyone who has made this show possible, starting with our distinguished panel. Cheever, what's going on with the Greek, who's, who's photobombing me right now? What's going on with the Geek in Paradise? What do you want our Twilight right to know about? Well, I don't know, man. I'm just thinking mining Bitcoin sounds really good. Maybe I can go and cash in on a little of this. We may have lost Chibert to a life of Bitcoin mining. Okay. <laughs> uh, Chibert is currently, I think, on uh, Vicodin, so I'm going to skip him and go over to Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on uh, with your travel schedule? When will you be back in studio? When will you be able to talk to us from a, a more decent connection? More importantly, what's going on in enterprise efficiency? Well, by next week's episode, I should be back at the Digital Swamp and on that uh, high-tech, high-performance line that we're used to. Uh, in the meantime, what we're doing at Enterprise Efficiency is just coming up with more ways of telling the IT executive story and bringing information to those IT executives to help them be more efficient, more effective, and uh, more able to bring value to their organization. And as always, if you are an IT executive who has a story to tell, some, uh, some wisdom or information that you think might be valuable for your peers, I'd love to hear from you. Drop me a note, franklin at enterpriseefficiency.com. And thank you very much. Speaking of Digital Swamp, let's go to our guest, Jeff Enters. Jeff from HP, what kind of projects do you have going on? Where can people find you? Where can people find more about HP? Thanks, Padre. Uh, so obviously, uh, hp.com slash services, which is there at the bottom of the screen. I'll be out there at Interop. Uh, I'm, the, I'm uh, taking care of everything from an HP perspective as, as it relates to Interop Net. So you can come stop by the NOC or stop by the booth and visit us. Uh, we have our transformation experience workshop, which is kind of some of the mobility and connectivity, networking, stuff that we uh, talked about a little bit earlier and strategi strategizing for those go-forward uh, initiatives. And so if you want to talk a little bit about that and see what our transformation experience workshop is about, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. And then uh, we got our Discover coming up, uh, Discover event coming up beginning of June. So any one of those swing by, ask for me or uh, check out uh, our booth. 
And uh, if you find him, Jeff will buy you a taco. <laughs> I don't know. What? Like a, yeah, sure. Is it the tacos the other day? Uh, Is that yes, what they the tacos, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Those okay. are good. Inside joke, but okay, it's an interrupt. Thing. You, now, now you have to come to interrupt to find out exactly what's going on with the tacos and HP. And get a free taco. <laughs> yes, yes. Paul Goodison, CEO of Cormit, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, where can people find out more about your services or find out about uh, live opportunities to see your solution in action? Padre, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, you can certainly get our website, cormant.com. It's at the bottom of the screen there, C-O-R-M-A-N-T.com. Uh, we'll be at Vegas for actually a couple of weeks. We've got Data Center World at the end of April, beginning of May, uh, straight into Interop at the beginning of May. So we'll be at both shows live, showing off the solution. We're a sponsor of the Interop Net, so everything that's there will be documented and being managed uh, from an infrastructure point of view using our tool. Come by and see that. We'd love to see you. Uh, or get in touch with us via the website, and we can we can have a conversation. We'd love to show you what we do. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, thank you also to our super producer, Carson Bondi, and to our super TD, who, well, he puts up with a lot of quiet nonsense. Jason, just for giggles, might there be some place where our enterprise viewers can find out more about what Android could do for, well, their networks? <laughs> Sure, twit.tv slash AAA stands for All About Android. And, uh, yeah, we talk about Android every week. I don't know how much of an enterprise focus we necessarily have on the show, but the topic comes up from time to time. So. It's all enterprise. It yeah, really but Jason, is. I've got a 32-inch Android tablet in my lab. I mean, that sounds enterprise <laughs> that's enterprising. to me. That's, that's enterprising for sure. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, and so as long as we're here, hey, you, could, 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 could you come a little closer? I, I want to talk to you for a second. You see, I've noticed that there's a lot of you who are not watching the live stream. And we do Twyit live every week, Monday at noon Pacific time from the Brick House. That's right. If you come watch us live, not only do you get to see how the sausage is made. I mean, you get to see all the stuff that doesn't go into the final version of the video. But you also get to participate in our live chat room at irc.twit.tv. And while you're there, you get to see, well, some of the most brilliant trolls, some of the funniest people, and some of the brightest engineers. It's all part of the Twit experience. Also, you could join us at our Twiet YouTube page at youtube.com slash Twiet. It's a, a brand new thing for us. We're trying to, we'll build out the Twiet Riot community. So what I want you to do is jump in there and subscribe so that we know where you are, so that when we need to find you and mobilize the Twiet Riot, well, it makes it just that much easier. Also, you can subscribe to Twite. You can have it delivered automatically into each and every single device of your choosing. If you've got an iPad, yep. iPhone, of course. Android phone, Android tablet, zombie Zoom, all these things are good. We give you the links that you need to have Twite dropped into your box each and every single week automatically. Why not take advantage of the wonder that is the internets? Also, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. There you'll be able to, to suggest topics for future episodes of Twiet. You'll be able to tell me how horribly I did on a previous episode. You'll be able to make fun of Chibert, and you'll be able to follow the life of the digital Jesuit. Finally, I want to thank CyberDog in the chat room for helping us out with our show, show notes. And by the way, he is going to be at Interop. He's part of the Interop team. And to all of you, the Twiet Riot who keeps coming back each and every single week, to find out what's going on in the life of the enterprise. I'm Father Robert Balasare, and remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. <laughs> ah!